All right, we're going to look at the last of the metaphysical poets uh, on our course in 17th century literature, uh, the Anglican divine by the name of uh, Thomas Traherne. Uh, Traherne was born 1636 or 37, not exactly sure, some dispute over that, and he uh, dies in 1674. So uh, I believe in around the same, same time as Milton, but did not leave live the, the same lengthy life. Uh, Traherne's uh, work is uh, was not particularly influential in his day and is, was overlooked by uh, scholarship, including uh, T.S. Eliot, who basically ignored him in his discussion of the metaphysical poets. But I think that there is reason for considering his works uh, to be worthy of reading and to count him amongst uh, the metaphysical poets, among the better of them. And um, uh, uh, that's largely because of uh, his, his mysticism uh, in this case. And this is a tendency that we already saw with, with Vaughn last time. There's a way in which he is trying to explain matters of, of truth and knowledge and, and, and the faculties, whether it's, whether it's the heart or the mind, through theological and rational means and and to connect them this way and and through a series of of conceits that uh, really fit in with uh the idea of the period in which he's writing the baroque period or it's, if you think about baroque uh, uh, in terms of uh bach the and his music are very intricate and connected and and movements back and forth um and at the same time, what is interesting about Traherne, at least interesting to me as a romantic scholar, is the way in which he seems uh, even more strongly than Vaughan uh, to anticipate uh, some of the uh, key themes of romanticism and, and to some degree makes him sound like a bit of a Platonist, uh, which he also shares with, with Vaughan. Um, but particular, and this is not Platonic. Um, it might be more Neoplatonic. A, a uh, belief, or at least an expression of uh, of childish innocence, somehow idealized. Now, this can push him in the direction of thinking that he is um, denying uh, original sin. And I think I don't think that that is the case. I think we can see something along the lines of that, at least implicitly in in Wordsworth, where he talks about innocence being our original state and uh, the fall, something that comes to us uh, as we get socialized. So the state of nature is, is good and unfallen and the fall, the fall happens as a, as a result of socialization. That's Wordsworth's account, at least in his Immortality Ode. Um, but we don't see that here in, in Traherne. Um, we do get a sense uh, of uh, the idealization of innocence that we also see in Blake's poetry. Um, but we don't uh, get any suggestions that uh, he was not sinful, per se, and that the fall uh, came to him. Uh, rather, he's, as, as I say, idealizing it, presenting it as a sort of a golden age. Um, and and so and that, so that leans in the very same direction as romanticism, but I think does not quite go to the same extent. And certainly also, as we're going to see with the final poem that we look at, the anticipation um, is very strongly connecting uh, this idea of nature and the way it anticipates or is a reflection of God's handiwork uh, itself also uh, is completed in God. Um, and not in some vague utopian idea of uh, delight in the future, but rather is completed in the person uh, and works uh, of God. And so that differentiates them very strongly from those that follow. But I want to look at a series of poems here. Uh, the first one uh, is the poem Innocence, probably seems the best one to start off with, given what I just said. I remember uh, the poet William Blake's uh, collection of poems, Songs of Innocence and Experience, and they're two contrary states of the human soul. There's nothing of that here with, Traher with Traherne. He's not talking about a state of contraries, uh, both of which to some degree are 
impossible for us to live with and united uh, through the means of the imagination. There's no appeal to the imagination in Traherne as the unifying faculty. So it doesn't bear the influence of Lockean empiricism because for Locke, the imagination was the means of connecting the sense impressions and uniting them and providing some sort of integration essential for romantic uh, thinking that we understand the imagination that way. But likewise, we'll see the same, you'd see the same in uh, the writing of Immanuel Kant. And so that idea of the imagination is the unifying or divine faculty uh, is not present in these metaphysical poets. That is a later development. And in place of that faculty of the imagination, which allegedly unites uh, everything, we have God who unites everything. So much more of a traditional and uh, defensible uh, position on this. But let's look at this poem, Innocence, by Traherne. Innocence. Note the four-line stanzas of rhyming couplets very simple and reflect in some sense the, su the subject that he's trying to describe. Innocence, but that which most I wonder at, which most I did esteem my bliss, which most I boast and ever shall enjoy is that within I felt no stain nor spot of sin. No darkness then did overshade, but all within was pure and bright. No guilt did crush, no, nor fear invade, but all my soul was full of light. A joyful sense and purity is all that I can remember. The very night to me was bright, t'was summer in December. A serious meditation did employ my soul within, which taken up with joy did seem no outward thing to note, but fly all objects that do feed the eye. While it those very objects did admire and prize and praise and love, which in their glory most are hid, which presence only doth remove. Their constant daily presence I rejoicing at did see, and that which takes them from the eye of others offered them to me. No inward inclination did I feel to avarice or pride. My soul did kneel in admiration all the day. No lust nor strife polluted then my infant life. No fraud nor anger in me moved, no malice, jealousy, or spite. All that I saw I truly loved, contentment only and delight were in my soul. O oh, heaven, what bliss did I enjoy and feel? What powerful delight did this inspire? For this I daily kneel. Whether it be that nature is so pure and custom only vicious, or that sure God did by miracle the guilt remove, and make my soul to feel his love so early, or that t'was one day wherein this happiness I found, whose strength and brightness so do ray that still it seems to me to surround. Whate'er it is, it is a light so endless unto me that I a world of true delight did then and to this day do see. That prospect was the gate of heaven. That day the ancient light of Eden did convey into my soul. I was an Adam there, a little atom in a sphere of joys. Oh, there my ravished sense was entertained in paradise and had a sight of innocence which was beyond all bound and price. An antipast of heaven sure, I on the earth did reign. Within me, without me, all was pure. I must become a child again. So it concludes with the line that those who would seek to enter the kingdom of God must become as little children, echoing uh, Christ's own words here, and really amplifying that theme uh, and, and really uh, that phrase, the antipast, the foretaste of heaven is the emphasis here uh, uh, in uh, innocence and connects it with childhood very strongly. So he uses a Jesus analogy uh, and, and to some sense, prescription of what the state of the believer must be uh, like to be in the kingdom of God and presses it hard uh, on the uh, state of childhood and seems to reflect on the fact that he had experienced it so and fell away from that um, from whatever means or for whatever means. 
whether it be that nature is so pure and custom only vicious, which will be the position of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and it will be that of all the romantics. So they fall because of a source outside of them. So they're brought about to fall, but they themselves internally have a nature that is pure and unsullied, which they can recover by means of imagination, or that sure God did by miracle the guilt remove. He recognizes that he is guilty, but he's hedging his bets. He's not sure about this. He's not ascribing to the view which uh, is in the Romantics, which is effectively a heretical view of human nature. Um, um, and make my soul to feel his love so early, oh, or that or that twas one day there in this happiness I found whose strength and brightness so do ray. That still it seems me to surround, whatever it is. He, he's not sure he's not going to ascribe to it. And that's probably experientially um, accurate. Um, he's not doctrinally pronounced, he's, he's, he's experientially pronouncing. Whereas again, in Rousseau and the Romantics, it really is presented as a fixed form of doctrine. Uh, the state's primal innocence uh, sullied by the sins of others, which eventually lead the soul to fall. Now, again, to be fair to Wordsworth in the Immortality Ode, he says that there's something in the soul that inclines towards imitating the world um, and, and itself leads itself to sin, in which case the uh, cause of that is itself uh, something sinful within us, which belies the claimed state of innocence. Uh, there's no speculation of that here. In fact, as I say, he hedges his bets on that fact. But he does say that this light is the, uh, to use Wordsworth's phrase, the fountain light of his day. It's the cause of his rec recognition of the joys of this life. Um, and and uh, it has an outcome to it, which is the delight he has in God. But he's connecting the end to the beginning here. And that's an important feature for him is how these two things are connected. So the, to use the language of etiology, the initial cause, God's creation, his state in that creation as a child is uh, completed eschatologically in the kingdom of God, which has not yet fully come. And he is like, and again, I use this, uh, or he uses this metaphor that we've seen repeatedly, the idea of the garden metaphor and he being an atom in that garden. Uh, so a return to a state of innocence. If you want to see amplification on this same sort of theme, obviously we could read Milton's Paradise Lost, which speaks of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that tree, which brought death into our world and all our woe with loss of Eden. Till one greater man restore us and regain the heavenly seat. Here, same sort of thematic focus the recovery of a lost paradise. How does he do it? Well, in the case of Traherne, it's simply by reflecting on childhood. Milton has not got uh, such a uh, uh, benign view or um, clear view. And the one thing that I would be uh, not uh, skeptical, but would note about Traherne's view is that there's no mention of the cross here. Uh, so again, it's a philosophical and theological connection based on causes, but not on the means by which the causes were reconciled and God actually demonstrated his love to the world, which is not simply by the goodness of his creation or the uh, blessedness of the new creation, but by means of the atonement. And so that's lacking here in this poem, Innocence. Uh, let me look at another poem here by him. This one's called Wonder. It's very much in the same vein. Uh, wonder, how like an angel came I down? How bright are all things here? When first among his works I did appear, oh, how their glory me did crown. The world resembled his eternity in which my soul did walk and everything that I did see did with me talk. The skies in their magnificence, the lively, lovely air, Oh, how divine, how soft, how sweet, how fair. The stars did entertain my sense and all the works of God so bright and pure, so rich and great did seem as if they ever must endure in my esteem. A native health and innocence within my bones did grow. And while my God did all his glory show, I felt a vigor in my sense that was all spirit. I within did flow with seas of life like wine, 
I nothing in the world didn't know, but twas divine. Harsh, ragged objects were concealed, oppressions, tears and cries, sins, griefs, complaints, dissensions, weeping eyes were hid, and only things revealed which heavenly spirits and the angels prize. The state of innocence and bliss, not trades and poverties, did fill my sense. The streets were paved with golden stones, the boys and girls were mine. Oh, how did all their lovely faces shine? The sons of men were holy ones, and joy and beauty they appeared to me, and everything which here I found, while like an angel I did see, adorned the ground. Rich diamond and pearl and gold, in every place was seen, rare splendors, yellow, blue, red, white, and green. Mine eyes did everywhere behold great wonders clothed with glory did appear. Amazement was my bliss. That and my wealth was everywhere. No joy to this. Cursed and devised property, proprieties, with envy, avarice, and fraud, those fiends that spoil even paradise, flew from the splendor of mine eyes, and so did hedges, ditches, limits, bounds. I dreamt nor aught of those, but wandered over all men's grounds and found repose. Proprieties themselves were mine and hedges, ornaments, walls, boxes, coffers, and their rich contents. Contents did not divide my joys, but all combine. Clothes, ribbons, jewels, laces, I esteemed my joys by others worn. For me, they all to wear them seemed when I was born. So once you, again, you can see uh, in this little poem, Wonder, this repeated emphasis on the way in which uh, his childhood is an, in an Edenic state um, and is a, an anticipation uh, which is only consummated in the new heaven and the new earth, which he actually, in terms of his phrasing, deliberately echoes in describing the uh, colors and the jewels, uh, reference to the heavenly Jerusalem. If you look at the book of Revelation and how it's described in uh, chapters uh, uh, 20 and onwards. And, and the gates, but the but the streets paved with gold stones, etc. He's seeing his childhood as a proleptic anticipation of that eschatological vision of the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, but he's seeing it in relation to his actual childhood. Now, I would say, for my for my liking, that um, this, although it might it must be wonderful for Traherne to have such a vision, um, ignores the cross in his. Uh, discussion. So for all of the connection of causes, initial to final, which I really like here in Traherne, um, there is a, a, a relative uh, ignorance or downplaying of the significance of the cross in tying these two together. So very little of suffering and very little of, uh, of, of the uh, necessity of the atonement here in his poetry, which we don't see let's say earlier in, in Herbert, and we don't see in, in Dunn. Dunn sees the, and Herbert both recognize the contrarieties in human experience and human existence and recognize even within themselves uh, the sin that drives them to the need of Christ's atonement. Um, Traherne uh, places no emphasis on this. And so he emphasizes the joys so it's an interesting uh, accompaniment and part of the whole metaphysical tradition, and it leans in the direction of romanticism, which does so in a way that is doctrinal and not simply uh, in terms of connecting the causal dots, as it were. Um, the preparative, I'm, I'm going to skip over, although I, I did assign it for reading. It's more or less in the same vein. Um, and I'm going to skip over it because the I want to look at the anticipation, which is a, a much longer poem and connects the, uh, the, the senses of, of cause and effect or initial cause of creation and the final cause of, of consummation, of redemption and glory, and connects them very strongly in a poem in a way that sounds a lot more uh, doctrinal than the other poems. I think it's implicit in those other poems, but those other poems um, are emphasizing uh, the Edenic state 
in the anticipation, we rather see a the consummation of that. But note again the emphasis, which is which is there um, hinted at or explicitly stated in the title. It's it's more about the anticipation than the consummation. And so he's not again setting aside the cross, but he's setting aside he's he's emphasizing the way in which this good earth, this created order. Um, has a, a it's like a signpost pointing pointing to a better world which is referred to in revelation as the new heaven and the new earth so the anticipation this is a rather lengthy um but connects and amplifies what i've been saying about his previous poems i uh, note this is taken from the oxford book of metaphysical verse uh, this extract um, of mystical verse, rather. And um, you, you will see that sense of Protestant mysticism here, which unlike um, the uh, mysticism of the Middle Ages places no emphasis on the cross. So it, it's tending already towards a rationalism um, and uh, in a way that to me is thoroughly problematic. But still, the anticipation by Thomas, Tom, Thomas Traherne. My contemplation dazzles in the end of all I comprehend and soars above all heights, diving into the depths of all delights. Can he become the end to whom all creatures tend, who is the father of all infinites? Then may he benefit, receive from things and be not parent only of all springs. The end doth want the means and is the cause whose sake by nature's laws is that for which they are. Such sands, such dangerous rocks, we must beware. From all eternity, a perfect deity, most great and blessed, he doth still appear. His essence perfect was in all its features. He ever blessed in his joys and creatures. From everlasting, he whose joys did need and all whose joys proceed from him eternally. From everlasting, his felicity complete and perfect was, whose bosom is the glass wherein we all things everlasting see. His name is now, his nature is forever. None can his creatures from their maker sever. The end in him from everlasting is the fountain of all bliss. From everlasting, it efficient was and influence did emit that caused all before the world we do adore this glorious end because all benefit from it proceeds both are the very same the end and fountain differ but in name that so the end should be the very spring of every glorious thing and that which seemeth last the fountain and the cause attained so fast that it was first and moved the efficient who so loved all worlds and made them for the sake of this, it shows the end complete before and is a perfect token of his perfect bliss. The end complete, the means must needs be so, by which we plainly know from all eternity the means whereby God is, must perfect be. God is himself the means whereby he doth exist. And as the sun by shinings clothed with beams, so from himself to all his glory streams, who is a sun, yet what he himself doth list. His endless wants and his enjoyments be from all eternity immutable in him. They are his joys before the cherubim. His wants appreciate all, and being infinite, permit no being to be mean or small that he enjoys, or is before his sight. His satisfaction do his wants delight. Wants are the fountains of felicity. No joy could ever be uh, were there no want. No bliss, no sweetness, perfect were it not for this. Want is the greatest pleasure because it makes all treasure. Oh, what a wonderful profound abyss is God, in whom eternal wants and treasures are more delightful since they both are pleasures. He infinitely wanteth all his joys, no want the soul ever cloys, and all those whose wanted pleasures he infinitely hath. What endless measures, what heights and depths may we in his felicity conceive, whose very wants 
our endless pleasures. His life in wants and joys is infinite, and both are felt as his supreme delight. He's not like us, possession doth not cloy, nor sense of want destroy. Both always are together. No force can either from the other sever. Yet there's a space between that's endless. Both are seen distinctly still, and both are seen forever. As soon as e'er he wanteth all his bliss, his bliss, though everlasting, in him is. His essence is all act. He did that he all act might always be. His nature burns like fire. His goodness infinitely does, does desire to be by all possessed. His love makes others blessed. It is the glory of his high estate and that which I forevermore admire. He is an act that doth communicate. From all to all eternity, he is that act, an act of bliss, wherein all bliss to all that will receive the same or on him call is freely given. From whence, tis easy even to sense to apprehend that all receivers are in him, all gifts, all joys, all eyes, even all at once that ever will or shall appear. He is the means of them, they not of him. The, the holy cherubim, souls, angels, from him came who is a glorious, bright, and living flame that on all things doth shine and makes their face divine. And holy, holy, holy is his name. He is the means both of himself and all whom we, the fountains, means, and end do call. So as I say, he presents this poem in terms of etiology, in terms of causes, uh, and in terms of the anticipation of causes. In some ways, it's a, 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 an approach that C.S. Lewis amplifies in his work, The Four Loves. Uh, and it, in many ways, it's an Augustinian emphasis that all our loves are, are sort of uh, anticipations. They're forms of wants, but wants that are completed in God. So in, again, in Augustine's Confessions, he says, Lord, that you, you've made us for yourself, and yet our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. And the, that sense of, of want, which Herbert reflects in, in his poetry, like in the Poe, uh, the pulley and and talks about a a a need or a want that is lacking and does not give this sense of completeness in the world because it, the completeness would then lack God. And in fact, the God is the way in which these things are all pulled together. So there's uh, there are affinities there that are met. But you can see why uh, we could we would call Traherne a metaphysical poet. He writes in rather philosophical and strongly theological uh, terms describing experience and yet in, uh, in a Christian fashion, uh, connecting them in our completion in God. As before, I say, there is no mention of, of the cross here. And to my mind, that's a deficiency of the poetry and a deficiency of, of the view. But all the same, the connection upon the way in which all things meet and hold together in Christ um, is a biblical emphasis and needs to be stated and poems like the anticipation, uh, which are uh, anticipating the completion, which we do find in God, are nonetheless consonant with that. I think it's worth uh, concluding uh, 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 and taking up a, a lecture on the course to look at Traherne. Um, I think he is a, a worthy subject of study and a way of connecting um, what I said at the beginning of the course, this the Elizabethan world picture seems to survive in some ways intact in Traherne's view. The breaches, the disruptions, the contradictions, uh, the chaos which marks uh, Dunn's poetry and uh, we've seen in some of the other uh, poetry of the period and writing is, is less in evidence here. Uh, we get more a sense of the glass half full rather than uh, looking at the contradictions and the challenges of modern life. Um, I, am, I suspect to some degree it's a matter of taste, but in the end, I think uh, we can certainly, with good reason, uh, read Traherne with delight, uh, if not 
to cast him as a proto-romantic for reasons that I've already suggested. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this and uh, bless you. <laughs>